Melchizedek, he's one of the most mysterious personages in Scripture. I mean, he just shows up out of nowhere. He's mentioned here, and then he's mentioned in Psalm 110, verse 4, which is a prophecy about Christ being a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And then he's mentioned nine times in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7. So that's history, prophecy, and fulfillment. Now, here's what we know about him, okay? Uh, ten things, real quick. He was the king of Salem. He was the priest of the Most High God, the only king priest in the Old Testament. He brought bread and wine. That's going to end up being emblems of the New Covenant memorial that Christ instituted in the upper room and then later revealed to Paul the Lord's Supper for the body of Christ. Uh, number four, representing the, the body and blood of Christ. Number four, he blessed Abram. Number five, Abram gave him tithes. Number six, he was without father, without mother, and without descent. Number seven, he had neither beginning of days nor end of life. Number eight, he was made like unto the Son of God. Number nine, he had an abiding priesthood. And number ten, he was greater than Abraham. Let's read real quick from Hebrews 7. Take a few more extra minutes here. Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, without, uh, uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed the better. Now I'm going to stop reading there, but you need to read Hebrews 5, 6, and 7 to get all the context of this. It's commonly taught that Melchizedek was either a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ or he was Shem, the son of Noah, who was still alive in the days of Abraham. But there's problems with that. First of all, if he's Christ, the right, and of course Christ made many pre-incarnate appearances. But if Melchizedek is Christ, Hebrews said he was like unto the Son of God, not that he was the Son of God, and... It says after that Christ was going to be a high priest after, it says after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, differentiating Christ from Melchizedek. And there are other issues. If you really search it out, I've studied the issue. You can see some problems. It sure looks like he could be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ based on some things that are said about him, but it doesn't, it doesn't. When you look at everything, it, it just doesn't work. There are some problems there. And as far as Shem is concerned, his genealogy and death is recorded in the Scripture, not Melchizedek's. So it's not Shem. I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to suggest that it's Melchizedek. <laughs> it is who he says he is. He's a real person in history. You see, Hebrews 7 draws a contrast between the priesthood of Melchizedek and the Levitical priesthood, that, and it shows how the, how the, 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 the priesthood of Melchizedek was, was better than the Levitical priesthood. And Christ is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, okay? not Aaron, not the Levitical priesthood. In the Levitical priesthood, genealogy was essential. And you can find this in Nehemiah 7, verse 63 to 65, until the priests could prove their genealogy there, they couldn't serve in the, uh, in the temple. There was an appointed age of beginning and ending. But Melchizedek, that he was without father and mother and descent, could simply refer to the fact his priesthood had nothing to do with his genealogy. All right? Because it's not after the Levitical priesthood, it's something else. And in a book full of genealogies, the book of Genesis, his is nowhere to be found. That he had neither beginning of days nor end of life and an abiding priesthood could simply refer to the fact his priesthood did not have a set age of beginning or ending. Okay, So, in other words, he's described in such a way as to make him a type of Christ. That's what I believe about it. I believe he's a type of Jesus Christ, an historical figure and a type of the resurrected Christ. 
It's interesting, again, he's a priest of the Most High God. He knows the Most High God, and he has bread and wine. All this in those days before the law, just showing up like that, but there's not a lot of explanation given. But when you look at the comparison, making him a type of Christ, they're both a priest and king. They're both the king of Salem, which becomes Jerusalem. They're both the king of righteousness and peace. They both, the issues of bread and wine there with them, and both are greater than Abraham, both have an endless priesthood, and both without father, mother, and descent. Which, by the way, another issue about Christ being Melchizedek, he become, Jesus Christ becomes the high priest after his incarnation. Right? After he takes on flesh. Read, study it in Hebrews. He becomes the high priest after his incarnation. He had a mother. He had a genealogy. He had a recorded birth and recorded death. No, Melchizedek didn't. So you just, it's an interesting study, and it's not my point in the course of verse by verse through Genesis to break out into a deep study of Melchizedek. That's just some things to think about, and you can study it further for yourself.